We're about three episodes into this Dodge Viper project and we haven't talked about the project yet, so it's probably about time to jump in. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take a Dodge Viper and we're gonna make it go off-road. Now there are a lot of ways to make an off-road car. There's sort of a spectrum. Safari is a mild modification, most of the same suspension components, a small lift, two or three inches, some slightly off-road tires, maybe some lights, and a basket on the roof. There's always a basket on the roof. Rally is a little more capable, more ground clearance, more serious tires, custom control arms and shocks. Up from there, you've got your pre-runners and your trophy trucks. These are all very capable and very expensive. We're going to land somewhere just north of Rally. I guess we could call it a Rally Viper that has a nice ring to it. Really, I'd like to just blast through sand washes and whoops in the desert. A 3-inch lift would look cool, 6-inch, even better. But we're going to go a full 12 inches here. I know some of you want me to convert that to metric, but this car is so American that there is no metric conversion. It's going to get some serious off-road tires, maybe mud terrain tires. Typically the drawback of these is that you get a lot of road noise, but this car is so loud driving down the road it kind of sounds like a monster truck anyway, so I don't think it's going to matter. I'm also not going to do the thing where I take a body and drop it onto the frame of a lifted truck. Also, nothing against this, but this wouldn't be an off-road Viper. It would be an off-road truck wearing a Viper hat. No, we're keeping the frame, we're keeping the V10, we're going to modify the front and rear suspension, add some long travel shocks, add some steel bumpers, throw some spare tires in the trunk, and send it across the desert. Now, to my knowledge, nobody has done this before. There was a TV show in the 90s about a Dodge Viper called Viper. It lasted four seasons, somehow, and it did have a Dodge Viper that could transform into an off-road Viper with CGI that was at least as convincing as the show's acting. But this doesn't count. Dodge also made the SRT-10 truck, which is a Ram powered by a Dodge Viper engine. This is not exactly an off-road Viper, mostly because it's not a Viper, but also because they lowered the truck 2.5 inches and put 22-inch wheels on it. Some people have mentioned that this might be similar to the local Motors Rally Fighter, which is kind of true, and I could maybe just buy one of these, but I don't want to for a few reasons. One, I don't want to buy a car. I want to build a car, and I want to do the design work myself. That's the fun part. Also, this is way out of my budget. It's missing two cylinders, it's kind of rough, and it's not the car I had on the poster on my wall when I was just a super small mat. No, the Viper is the correct car for this, specifically the RT-10. I've always said that the Viper is a great car, but it's not a very good car. It's actually kind of a terrible car. It's really, really good at a few things. One is looking absolutely bananas. The design is wild. It looks like nothing else. It's not trying to be a Ferrari or a Corvette. It has ridiculous fender flares, an absurdly long hood, Dodge's crosshair grill. It is a Viper and nothing else. Another thing it's great at is doing burnouts. It will do them all the time for no reason. Sometimes when you're not even trying. I once read that 8% of the early Vipers never made it home from the dealership without crashing. That's probably not true, but if you've driven one, you know that's super believable. The third great thing about this car is the engine. It has 10 cylinders and not 10 small cylinders. This thing is displacing 8 liters. That's double a 911 GT3, four times the original Honda S2000, five GR Yaris engines. It is 64 Honda Groms. Dodge picked the laziest, easiest way to make power, and they went all in. It looks amazing. It sounds amazing. It gets terrible gas mileage. The looks do not disappoint. The burnouts do not disappoint. Everything else, pretty disappointing. The brakes are laughably small for anything with this much power. The rear brakes are carryovers from a Mitsubishi Eclipse. The radiator is woefully unprepared for the heat given to it during even normal driving. The interior is plastic and cheap and always breaks in the same places. The air conditioning is a gentle hint of cool air in a cabin that is heated like an oven from giant exhaust pipes. The suspension does nothing to help traction and is too stiff even for average roads. All of this is bad for a sports car. If you took any decent sports car, lifted it a foot, put off-road tires on it, you would make it a worse car. But with a Viper, I think it's a lateral move at worst. Maybe not, but we're going to find out. The looks are wild. The sounds, the V10. This is the kind of car that really stokes the excitement of the little kid that we all once were, and that still exists as a part of us. Making it go off-road just cranks that up to 11, maybe 12, possibly 13. I could come up with all sorts of reasons to do this project, but if you have to ask why, this more than any of my other crazy projects won't make any sense to you. And that's fine. It's not for you. It's for me. I could also come up with all sorts of reasons why this is a bad idea. There's no roof. There's very little bending stiffness. The front and rear overhangs are obnoxious, so it has bad approach and departure angles. The frame is lightweight and has thin wall tubing, which is not great for bouncing off of rocks. The rollover protection is minimal. There are lots of cheap carryover parts on this car, but the ones that are bespoke and expensive are the ones that are going to get damaged first. But none of that matters, because off-road Viper.
I looked for a Viper for a while and I ended up buying one that was in pretty decent shape. It's all straight and clean. The air conditioning and cooling system have been upgraded to the point that they function. I could have saved money by getting a pile of junk, but I wouldn't have saved a lot. Vipers are weird. Most of them, it seems, have a salvage title. A lot of them are in really rough shape. It's one of those cars bought by people who always wanted one, and then they experience it for a few months and get rid of it. They say, don't meet your heroes, but I say, meet them. It gives you a better understanding of what the word hero means. Some people keep their Vipers, and these people are odd. People who customize their Vipers, also odd. The market shot up over the last few years, as with everything else, but it's starting to cool off, though some people haven't gotten the memo. You'll basically get the same car listed for sale, ranging from $35,000 to $75,000 with no reason. The first generation is the cheapest, and also the worst. The car was cleaned up by the third generation, but it also lost a lot of its charm. It became a less goofy kit car and more of a production sports car, which is good and also bad. The second generation is the ideal Viper. It has the same shape as the original car, but it has actual windows that roll up and down. It has air conditioning, more power, an optional fiberglass roof. The last three years of the 90s had 450 horsepower and forged pistons that would hold up to double that if you were so inclined to stuff a supercharger under the hood. I got a 99, which I'm convinced is the best year Viper. Later years got ABS and traction control and weaker engine internals. The 99 is the last great analog American sports car. It will not protect you from yourself. It will do exactly what you tell it to do. Even if you don't realize what you're telling it to do is to slide sideways into a Denny's. Buckle up. This is one of those projects that would be a lot easier if I was to just half-ass everything. And don't get me wrong, I do enjoy a good half-assing from time to time, but we're gonna do this correctly. I could just space up the springs a few inches, put on some off-road tires and slap on a roof basket, but no, I'm going to make fully custom laser cut and welded front suspension, completely new rear suspension, real off-road tires, custom fender flares, and slap on a roof basket. No, no, I'm just kidding, there's no basket. But where to put the spare tires? We'll throw them in the trunk. Probably stuff a floor jack in there and a jerry can. You might be thinking that two spares is overkill for a car that isn't gonna race, but you'd only think that if you've never been off-roading with me. I get flats all the time, constantly. It's pretty frustrating. The front suspension should be pretty easy. The Viper has double wishbone suspension up front with a relatively short upright. Off-road vehicles, like my 4Runner, often have a much taller upright. This is actually really convenient because if I lift my Viper and put the 4Runner suspension on it, the upper control arm lands in almost the same place as the original Viper upper control arm. Lower control arms will need to be lowered. I'll have to add tabs coming off the bottom of the frame. I'll probably reinforce these with some extra welded tubes on the bottom of the frame. Maybe bolted instead of welded in case I need to get to the oil pan for some reason. The control arms and uprights will all be box welded from steel laser cut by my friends over at Send Cut Send. I did this with the Jaguar uprights. It's pretty easy and box steel structures are actually really efficient. Rear suspension is gonna be a bit more challenging. Lifting the car puts the drive shafts right through this lower frame rail, so I'll have to cut that out and reinforce it with some gussets. Also need to drop the diff down so my half shaft angles aren't crazy at full droop, so new upper and lower control arms, new uprights, lower diff, new half shafts, new drive shafts, new shocks and springs. I probably need to find a locking diff, much lower gears, and you know what, let's just put in a solid rear axle. If I can find a solid rear axle that's complete and ready to go, that simplifies things quite a bit. The problem is finding that axle. I need a specific width, about 69 inches. Nice. I need a locker and I need gears somewhere around 470. Also, disc brakes and preferably something set up for five link suspension. The obvious choice is the axle from the Dodge Ram they put the Viper engine into. Unfortunately, that's not a great axle. It's known for exploding spider gears and there's not a huge aftermarket for it. The Raptor and Braptor are doing things that I'd like to be doing in the Viper, but those axles are too wide. The regular F-150 has the right axle width, but there doesn't seem to be a ton of people digging these out of junkyards and putting them on sand rails and buggies. I'm not exactly sure why, but it might be just because everybody wants to spend $8,000 on the fancy expensive aftermarket Ford 9-inch axles, which seems overkill. I'm also considering a Ford Bronco rear axle. Ford Performance sells a complete axle with an electronic locker in the ratio I want for less than $2,500. It's the right width, it's brand new, and while the Viper has a lot more engine torque, it doesn't have a low-range gearbox, so the actual torque going through the rear end will be a lot less. Jeep axles are a possibility, and I might do this, keep it in the Mopar family. The Rubicon axles are pretty stout and are almost the right width. It also looks like the links might work out well for the packaging. The Gladiator axle is a little more stout, but the mounts are in the wrong location, so if I go this way, I'll probably go with the Wrangler Rubicon axles. Both the Jeep and the Bronco axles are the Dana M220, which is a newer version of the Dana 44. I'll probably go with one of these. 
Steel front and rear bumpers will be made with laser cut steel. Fender flare is probably made out of fiberglass. We'll get some cool LED lights, so winch, take it out to the desert and send it. I'm actually not a staunch advocate of manual transmissions. They're fun and appropriate on this car under normal circumstances, but in this case, I think an automatic is probably the best. I've kind of slotted this into stage two of this build. I haven't done a ton of research on this, but it seems like the ZF 8HP70 would be a great transmission for an off-road Viper. There have been a few auto swaps into Vipers. A couple have shown up on Bring a Trailer recently, but most are using older GM or Torque Flight transmissions. A slow shifting old transmission seems like it would zap some of the Viper fun, but I think a modern eight speed with a good controller would actually make it more fun. I just gotta figure out how to get the engine and transmission to get down with each other. Four-wheel drive is a possibility, but it's a pretty small possibility. If I'm swapping out the transmission, there's probably something out there with a transfer case that I can use, maybe even that eight-speed, but the front axle makes it pretty difficult. Remember how I said I'd have to blow through the frame rails in the rear? Well, I'd have to do the same in the front, and that's where my lower control arms bolt, so that's not great. In fact, I'd probably have to move them even lower, which gives me even less structure to work with. Also, the place where the front differential goes has a giant oil pan in the way. Even if I get something like this to fit beside it, it's a huge tear up for the frame and there's not really a place for the drive shaft. I could solve most of these problems by just lifting the car another foot or so, but then it just looks ridiculous. This, totally reasonable. The kind of thing a responsible adult would do. But this, just wacky, nonsensical. But this, this is America. Probably not. The Viper is known for sending its drivers off-road without warning, but when you add a lower rear-end gear and off-road tires, this thing's going to be doing burnouts constantly. Also, this is not an especially safe car. No stability control, no traction control, no ABS, just two crappy 1990s airbags and a warning that specifically tells you how you're going to die if you flip the car over. This car is probably going to get a roll hoop and I'm probably going to tie it into the suspension points. This is not a car that was ever designed to land a jump, so doing so might turn it into a taco. But with the right suspension, some reinforcements, and some bump stops, I should be able to make it into a reasonably safe off-roader. So that's about it. This seems like a really straightforward build, but I always think that at the beginning of a project. The truth will come out in the details. Oh, and I have a title sponsor. I've never had a title sponsor before. I know some of you who have been watching this channel for a while are like, I bet it's Send, Cut, Send. But actually, it's Send, Cut, Send. You're right. Why is Send, Cut, Send sponsoring an off-road Viper? Well, aside from the fact that it's awesome, I'm gonna be using a ton of laser cut parts. Most of the things I'm changing will be using welded flat plates of steel and aluminum, probably some carbon fiber and wood here and there. The uprights, control arms, bumpers, brackets, roof rack, you can solve all of life's problems with laser cut parts. I mean, I'm single with no kids and no job, so I can solve all of my problems with laser cut parts. Your mileage may vary. Step one is to 3D scan the Viper to get it into the computer. We'll start that next week. I got a new scanner for this and it's pretty great. I'm also going to scan some other off-road suspensions so I can just use their geometry and parts. It's not cheating. It's reverse engineering. After that, we'll get the front suspension all laser cut and welded up. Then I'll figure out what rear axle I'm using and get some brackets laser cut and install them. Then I'll have a driving off-road Viper and I'll be done except for the front bumper, the rear bumper, the winch, the lights, the roof rack, the tire carrier, the roll hoop, the possible automatic transmission swap, probably putting in a new CarPlay stereo and fixing this paint chip I knocked off the first time I drove the car somewhere. If this project goes like my previous projects, it will be 80% of the way done in eight months and then sit that way for two years. But I would actually really like to get this car done in time for SEMA in October. I'd love to drive it from LA to Vegas all the way through the desert and show up covered in dirt and mud, preferably in one piece. That gives me about eight months, and since I think this project will take three months, we should just barely make it.